Hi, I'm Colleen Delaney. Let's talk about some books that are coming out this May. Hi, if you're new here, I'm Colleen. I talk about books and writing in the description. I always put a link to my newsletter and a couple of the books I've written and maybe some videos that pertain to this subject. If you have fun today, hit the subscribe button and hang out more regularly with me. As you can tell from the title of the video, this is slightly different than the usual video I do around this time of the month, which is I usually make predictions for book of the month. I talked about this in my reading check-in video I did a few weeks ago, but book of the month has been releasing a lot of clues to the point that we usually know now like four of the five to seven titles. So just predicting book of the month books, especially because I have a really hard time figuring out the clues, but no one else does it on the internet, isn't really that fun anymore. So I decided instead, I'm gonna do like a exciting new releases for the month. This is by no means an exhaustive list of all the books that are coming out in the month. And that would just be a video that's like way too long. So these are just some I wanna highlight, but I am still structuring it in terms of the genres that Book of the Month usually does. So we're, we've got historical fiction, contemporary slash literary fiction, fantasy, romance, I have some sci-fi on the list, thriller, mystery, some months I'll have horror, some months I won't, some months I'll have YA, some months I won't. I also wanted to add Aardvark into this because I've been noticing the last few months, Aardvark has had a title or two which I had put on my Book of the Month predictions video and I think it's worth adding them into the mix. I really do wish I had it in my budget to have um, two book subscription services because the last couple months, Aardvark has had some titles that I've really wanted, including A Love Song for Ricky Wilde and what the heck was that book called? Let's Look It Up, A Sweet Sting of Salt. And there's another one because my brain's just not working right now. So give me a second because I am going to figure it out. Oh, they had Bride, which I did end up already purchasing and Warm Hands of Ghosts, which I also wanted to read. So that's like, you know, there's been a book every month there that I really wanted to read too sometimes. And uh, yeah, so maybe... Maybe a second book subscription box is in the cards for me. I don't know. Okay, let's get into the books. We're gonna start with like the thriller mystery category. And if you're used to watching these videos for me, I keep my computer on my lap. If you notice I'm looking down, it's because there are a lot of books on this list and I can't remember every detail about all of them. That's the main reason. So the first one's One, one Perfect Couple by Ruth Ware. It's coming out on May 21st. It's a thriller. Currently has 617 ratings on Goodreads with a 3.95 average. Ruth Ware is a pretty prolific thriller writer. I've actually never read any of her books, but maybe it's time I start. Here's a quick description. Lila is in a bit of a rut. Her postdoctoral research has fizzled out. She's pretty sure they won't extend her contract and things with her boyfriend Nico, an expiring actor, aren't going great. When the opportunity arises for Nico to join the cast of a new reality TV show, The Perfect Couple, she decides to try out with him. A whirlwind audition process later, Lila finds herself whisked off to a tropical paradise with Nico, boating through the Indian Ocean towards Ever After Island, where the two of them will compete against four other couples, Bayer and Angel, Dan and Santana, Joel and Rami, and Connor and Zayna, in order to win a cash prize. But not long after they arrive on the deserted island, things start to go wrong. After the first channel leaves everyone rattled and angry, an overnight storm takes matters from bad to worse. Cut off from the mainland by miles of oceans, deprived of their phones and unable to contact the crew that brought them there, the group must band together for survival. As tensions run high and fresh water runs low, Lila finds that this game show is all too real and the stakes are life and death. My husband and I would 100% watch this show, so that's part of the reason I think this would be a really fun read. Let's move on to the next book, which is... The Return of Ellie Black by Amiko Jean. It currently has 392 ratings on Goodreads with a 4.2 average and is coming out on May 7th. Here is a quick description. Detective Chelsea Calhoun's life is turned upside down when she gets the call. Ellie Black, a girl who disappeared years earlier, has resurfaced in the woods of Washington State. But Ellie's reappearance leaves Chelsea with more questions than answers. It's been 20 years since Detective Chelsea Calhoun's sister van vanished when they were teenagers, and ever since she's been searching for signs, for closure, for other missing girls, but happy endings are rare in Chelsea's line of work. Then a glimmer. Local teenager Ellie Black, who disappeared without, two, without a trace two years earlier, has been found alive in the woods of Washington State. But something's not right with Ellie. She won't say where she's been or who she's protecting, and it's up to Chelsea to find the answers. She needs to get the bottom of what happened to Ellie for herself and for the memory of her sister, but mostly for the next girl who could be taken and who, unlike Ellie, might never return. That just sounds like a good run-of-the-mill, like missing persons type of thriller. 
that I would enjoy. I like a good thriller like that. Next, I've got The Deepest Lake by Andromeda Roma Romano Lax. Sorry, I like literally stopped filming and tried that three times. And I knew I was going to stumble over that last name. There's currently 121 rankings on Goodreads with a 3.82 average. And it's coming out on May 7th. Rose, the mother of 20-something aspiring writer Jules, has waited three months for answers about her daughter's death. Why was she swimming alone when she feared the water? Why did she stop texting days before she was last seen? When the official investigation rules the death an accidental drowning, the body possibly lost forever in Central America's deepest lake, an unsatisfied Rose travels to the memoir workshop herself. She hopes to draw on her own to draw her own conclusion and find closure. When Rose arrives, she is swept into the curious world created by her daughter's literary hero, the famous writing teacher, teacher Eve Marshall, a charismatic woman known for her candid and controversial memoirs. As Rose uncovers details about the days leading up to Jules' dis disappearance, she begins to suspect that this glamorous retreat package is hiding ugly truths. Is Lake, I'm going to mispronounce this because it's a real place. Atatlan, Atatlan, I'll write it for you right here. A place where traumatized women come to heal or a place where deeper injury is inflicted. I like the sound of that because it kind of reminded me very like tangentially to um, The Writing Retreat by Julia Barthes, which I really liked. I read that I think maybe in like February, but I like the idea of like weird stuff happening at writing retreats. Lastly, I have The Five Year Lie by Serena Bowen. I've read a Serena Bowen before, but it was a romance novel. She writes mostly romance. This is um, down as like a mystery slash thriller though. It comes out May 14th, the same day my book comes out. And uh, it's 432 pages. It has 223 ratings on Goodreads with a 4.15 average. On an ordinary Monday morning, Ariel Cafferty's phone buzzes with a disturbing text message. Something happens. I need, happened. I need to see you. Meet me under the candelabra tree ASAP. The words would be jarring from anyone, but the sender is of only the man she is the only man she ever loved, and it's been several years since she learned he died. Seeing Drew's name pop up is heart stopping. Ariel can't. Ariel's gut says it can't be real. But she goes to the tree anyway, she has to. Nobody shows. But the text upends everything she thought she knew about the day he left her. The more questions she asks, the more sinister the answers get. Only two things are clear. Everything she was told five years ago is wrong, and someone is still lying to her. The truth has to be out there somewhere. To safeguard herself and her son, she'll have to find it before it finds her. And with it, the answer of what became of Drew. I really like those kind of weird, like, sort like, I'm guessing this isn't going to be a supernatural twist. But I do kind of like when people, you think people are dead and they're actually not. They actually disappeared. Or like main character protagonists get their head messed with by people who they thought have died. Okay, let's move on to fantasy and sci-fi. Okay, I had to put a cough drop in my mouth because we are having like the worst allergy and asthma day of the year. Because um, our air quality is really bad today and our trees all exploded. So I apologize if the sound of that is bothering you. Let's start with The Ministry of Time by Callianne Bradley. Currently has 852 ratings on Goodreads with a 3.99 average. It comes out May 7th. And this is one that I feel like might be picked by either Book of the Month or Aardvark in particular because it just has kind of like a cool... Let me just tell you about it and then you can decide for yourself. In the near future, a civil servant is offered the salary for dreams and is shortly afterward told what project she'll be working on. A recently established government ministry is gathering expats from across history to establish whether time travel is feasible for the body, but also for the fabric of space time. She is tasked with working as a bridge, living with, assisting with, and monitoring the ex expat known as 1847, or Commander Graham Gore. As far as history is concerned, Commander Gore died on, John, on Sir John Franklin's doomed 1845 expedition to the Arctic. So he's a little disoriented to be living with an unmarried woman who regularly shows her calves surrounded by Atlantis comet concepts such as the washing machine, Spotify, and the collapse of the British Empire. But he adjusts quickly. He is, after all, an explorer by trade. Soon what the bridge initially thought would be, at best, a seriously uncomfortable housemate dynamic evolves into something much more. Over the course of an unprecedented year, Gore and the bridge fall haphazardly, fervently in love with consequences they never could have imagined. So that just... <laughs> It's like Kate and Leopold, but like I think more crazy stuff is going to happen. So it's like sci-fi and romance, but there's also time travel. So it's also like a little historical. It just seems like a really cool mix of a bunch of different genres. Next, I have The Last Murder at the End of the World by Stuart Turton. And I was like going back and forth about where to put this because it could kind of go in the thriller section, but it's a sci-fi story. And so I felt more like a sci-fi reader would be more apt to read a murder mystery with a sci-fi setting 
than a murder mystery reader to read a murder mystery with a sci-fi setting. Does that make sense? I don't know. That's why I put it here. It's got 1,358 ratings with a 4.03 average, which is quite good for that many ratings. So here's the confusing thing. I have it down as coming out on May 21st, but apparently there was an edition that came out on March 28th, which I assume is maybe in a different country because everywhere else I found it was not yet out, but I don't know. So maybe in the comments, someone can say, hey, this book's already out, I already read it. Or maybe it's coming out in May in the United States. I don't know. Here is your blurb. Solve the murder to save what's left of the world. Outside the island, there's nothing. The world was destroyed by a fog that swept the planet, killing everyone it touched. On the island, it is idyllic. 122 villagers and three scientists living in peaceful harmony. The villagers are content to fish, farm, and feast, to obey their nightly curfew, and to do what they're told by the scientists. Until, to the horror of the islanders, one of their beloved scientists is found brutally stabbed to death. And then they learn that the murder has triggered a lowering of the security system around the island, the only thing that was keeping the fog at bay. If the murder isn't solved within, within 107 hours, the fog will smother the island and everyone on it. But the security system has also wiped everyone's memories of exactly what happened the night before, which means that someone on the island is a murderer, and they don't even know it. That just sounded like a very cool concept. So we'll see if any book clubs pick it. If not, like just go by yourself, right? Next, we've got a fantasy. After some sci-fi business, we've got a fantasy. It's Goddess of the River by Vaishnavi Patel. She wrote Kaya Kate. So here's the thing. I didn't really like Kaya Kate, but it got nominated. It wasn't one of the finalists for um, Book of the Year from Book of the Month, but it did got get nominated as one of the like ones you could vote for for Book of the Month. So I assume... It's gonna be an add-on, if not a pick, because a lot of people really did like it. Um, this one currently has 154 ratings on Goodreads. It's got a 4.25 average, and it's coming out on May 21st. And I know I'm gonna read this description and be like, oh, this book sounds so good, because that's how I felt about Kai K, but I'm not gonna let myself buy it because I just didn't really like her writing style very much. A powerful reimagining of the story of uh, Ganga, Ganga, the Ganges, Ganga, goddess of the river and her doomed mortal son from Vashnavi Patel, the author of Kaike. A mother and a son, a goddess and a prince, a curse and an oath, a river whose course will change the fate of the world. I'm going to keep telling myself it's Ganga, right? Because no, Ganges, the Ganges River. I'm, I'm going to butcher this and I'm so embarrassed. Ganga? Hold on. We are looking at how to pronounce this name as well as how to say more interesting and often confusing names in some of the most mispronounced ones. I'm sorry, why does that man sound like he's an Argentinian seductor? It's too. So make sure to stay tuned for that. How do you say it? Well, depending on the local accent and local language, this can be said as Ganga. 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 But some might pronounce it as Ganga. 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 Okay, Ganga. Ganga, joyful goddess of the river, serves as caretaker to the mischievous godlings who roam her banks. But when their antics incur the wrath of a powerful sage, Ganga is cursed to become mortal, bound to her human form until she fulfills the obligations of a curse. Though she knows nothing of mortal life, Ganga weds King Shantanu and becomes a queen determined to reign, regain her freedom at no matter the cost. But in a cruel turn of fate, just as she is free of her binding, she is forced to leave her infant son behind. Her son, Prince Devavrata, unwittingly carries the legacy of Ganga's curse. And when he makes an oath that he will never claim his father's throne, he sets in motion a chain of events that will end in a terrible and tragic war. As the years unfold, Ganga and Deva, Deva Vrata are drawn, drawn together again and again, each confluence another step on a path that has been written in the stars in this deeply moving and masterful tale of duty, destiny, and the unwavering bond between a mother and a son. I mean, that sounds fantastic. Though I just clicked on some of the ratings and some of the negative ratings are the same problems I had with Kai K, so I am not going to read it, but you maybe want to. Uh, lastly, for fantasy, I have Evocation. I, why am I giving myself so many hard words to pronounce? This, I'm going to be honest, look at this cover. Okay, so if you love tarot like I do, and it's a big part of my book, The Hedge Witch, which is coming out on May 14th, most anticipated reads of. May, of course. This cover is The Hanged Man, basically. It's one of the tarot cards. And so that totally sold me. And the four symbols in the corner are the symbols for, um, I think they are at least. Sorry, I'm squinting. I think they're the symbols for earth, air, water, and fire. So that just seems right up my alley. Okay, so this is, I can't remember if I already said it, so let's just say it again. It's got 322 ratings on Goodreads 
and a 4.0 average and it's coming out on May 28th, which is my wedding anniversary. 13th wedding anniversary. As a teen, David Aristakov, Aristakarov, what is with me today? Was a psychic prodigy operating under the shadow of his oppressive occultist father. Now, years after his father's death and rapidly approaching his 30th birthday, he is content with the high powered life he's curated as a Boston attorney, moonlighting as a powerful medium for his secret society. But with power comes a price, and the devil has come to collect on an ancestral deal. David's days are numbered, and death looms at his door. Reluctantly, he reaches out to the only person he's ever trusted his ex boyfriend and secret society rival, Reese, for help. However, the only way to get Reese is through his wife, uh, Moira. I always want to say that name, Mora, because I went to school with a girl who spelled it that way and called it and pronounced it Mora, but a lot of people say Moira. Thrust into each other's care, emotions once very deep resurface, and the trio race to figure out their feelings for one another before the devil steals David away for good. This is um, book one in a series as well, I believe. Now let's go ahead and switch over to romance. Okay, so now we're going to move on to straight romance. I had to get up and now I feel like I look different. I'm slightly different in frame. I'm sorry. So the first one is Lies and Weddings by Kevin Kwan. Um, he wrote Crazy Rich Asians, which is his claim to fame. I never read Crazy Rich Asians. Um, my sister was so obsessed with that movie that she and her husband went to Singapore on their honeymoon. <laughs> so people who love it really love it. Uh, right now it has 294 ratings on Goodreads with a 4.02 average and it's coming out on May 21st. Here's your blurb. Rufus Long Gresham, future Duke of Greshamberry and son of former Hong Kong supermodel has depleted his trust fund basically. And behind all the magazine covers and Instagram stories and manners and yachts lies nothing more than a gargantuan mountain of debt. The only solution put forth by Rufus' scheming mother is for Rufus to attend his sister's wedding at a luxury eco resort, a veritable who's who's of sultans, barons, and oligarchs, and seduce a woman with money. Should he marry Solene de Courcy, a French hotel heiress with honey blonde trusses and a royal bloodline? Should he pursue Martha Dung, a tattooed venture capital genius who passes out billions like lollipops? Or should he follow his heart, betray his family, squander his legacy, and finally confess his love to the literal girl next door, the humble daughter of a doctor, Eden Tong. When a volcanic eruption burns through the nuptials and a hot mic exposes a secret tryst, the Gresham family plans and their reputation go up in flames. Can the once great dukedom rise from the ashes or will a secret tragedy hidden for two decades reveal a shocking twist? So that feels very much like Crazy Rich Asians. I mean, I don't read the book, but I did see the movie with like lots of scandal and wealthy people and beautiful things to think about. Next, I have This Summer Will Be Different by Carly Fortune. I particularly put this one on the list because um, it takes place on Prince Edward Island and I'm going to Prince Edward Island in June. So I'm very excited. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll try and grab this one um, if it's not a book of the month pick at um, a bookstore before, so I can read it before we go. Uh, it currently has 455 ratings on Goodreads with a 4.28 average and it's coming out on May 7th. Lucy is the tourist vacationing at a beach house on Prince Edward Island. Felix is the local who shows her a very good time. The only problem, Lucy doesn't know he's... He's her best friend's younger brother. Lucy and Felix's chemistry is unreal, but the least list of reasons why they need to stay away from each other is long, and they vow never to repeat that electric night again. It's easier said than done. Each year, Lucy escapes to PEI, oh, Prince Edward Island, for a big breath of coastal air, fresh oysters, and crisp vino verde with her best friend, Bridget. Every visit begins with a long walk on the beach beneath soaring red cliffs and a golden sun, and every visit, Lucy promises herself she won't wind up in Felix's bed again. If Lucy can't help being drawn to Felix, at least she's always kept her heart out of it. When Bridget suddenly flees Toronto a week before her wedding, Lucy drops everything to follow her to the island. Her mission is to help Bridget through her crisis and resist the one man she's never been able to. But Felix's sparkling eyes and flirty quips have been replaced with something new. And Lucy is beginning to wonder how safe her heart truly is. So that just sounds like a super fun beach read. And because it's going to be on Prince Edward Island and I'm going there, I feel like that would be fun to read. Next is The Honey Witch by Sydney Shields. It uh, currently has 616 ratings on Goodreads with a 3.77 average. And it comes out on May 14th. 21-year-old Marigold Claude has always preferred the company of the spirits of the meadow to any suitors who've tried to woo her. So when her grandmother whisks her away to the family cottage on the tiny island of Isle of Innisfree, with an offer to train her as the next honey witch, she accepts immediately. But her newfound magic and independence comes with a no one can fall in love with the honey witch. 
Mm. When Lottie Burke, a notoriously grumpy skeptic who doesn't believe in magic, shows up on her doorstep, Marigold can't resist the challenge to prove that her magic is real. But soon Marigold begins to care for Lottie in ways she never expected. And when darker magic awakens and threatens to destroy her home, she must fight for much more than her new home and risks losing her magic and her heart. My last romance is The Paradise Problem by Christina Lauren. It's coming out on May 14th. It currently has uh, 1,351 ratings on Goodreads with a 4.3 average and Christina Lauren are um, if you know who they are they're two authors who co-write together often they're pretty prolific Anna Green thought she was marrying Liam West Weston for access to subsidized family housing while at UCLA she also thought she'd signed divorce papers when the graduation caps were tossed and they both went their merry ways three years later Anna is a starving artist living paycheck to paycheck while West is a Stanford professor three years later one of my best friends is a professor I don't know if that's realistic. <laughs> he may be one of the heirs to the Weston Foods conglomerate, but he has little interest in working for the Heartless Corporation his family built from the ground up. He is interested, however, in his $100 million inheritance. There's just one catch. Due to an antiquated clause in his grandfather's will, Liam won't see a penny of it until he's been happily married for five years. I like that. Just when Liam thinks he's in the home stretch, pressure mounts from his family to see this mysterious spouse, and he has no choice but to turn to the one person he's afraid to introduce his one percenter parents to, his unpolished, not so ex-wife. But in the presence of family, Liam's fears quickly shift from whether this feisty, foul-mouthed, paint-splattered Anna can play the part to whether the toxic world of wealth will corrupt someone as pure of heart as his surprisingly grounded and loyal wife. Liam will have to ask himself if the price tag on his flimsy cover story is worth losing true love that sprouted from a lie. That sounds cute. Minus the fact that I don't think no matter how much money you have, you'd be a professor at Stanford when you're 25. I don't think Stanford tuition pays for 25 25-year-old 25 professors. <laughs> okay, let's move on to contemporary and lit fic. The first is Wives Like Us by Plum Sykes. It comes out May 14th. It currently has only 15 ratings on Goodreads with a 3.4, but it sounded like kind of like a fun summary read, which is why I put it on this list. If you think the English countryside is all green wellies, muddy land rovers, and gray-haired ladies in tweed, then you've never visited the bottoms. Welcome to the rose-strewn country of Oxfordshire and the tiny Cotswold village of Little Bottom, Middle Bottom, and Great Bottom, and Moncton Bottom, Bottom, recently annexed by a glittering new breed of female, the country princess. Following a ghastly row about missing suite of diamonds, Tata Hawkins has flounced out of Moncton Bottom Manor with her daughter Minty and executive butler Ian Palmer in tow, decamping to the old coach house to teach her husband Brian a lesson. But things don't go to plan. Brian disappears to Venice with a bikini designer. Selby Fairfax, the glamorous American divorcee who has inherited the beautiful estate next door, Great Bottom Park, is refusing Tata's overtures at friendship. Tata's two best friends, Sophie Thompson and Fernanda Ovington-Williams, are distracted by their own problems. Worst of all, Ian has nowhere to store his collection of vintage Gucci loafers. Will Tata ever return to the comforts of the manor? Will Sophie's husband start appreciating her? Will Fernanda ever a find a replacement Manny for her friendless son, Luca? Will Selby believe in love again? With the help of a pig farmer as moonlighting as a personal assistant, a male model moonlighting as a stable hand, a London barrister moonlighting as a gentleman farmer, and a hypochondriac American tech mogul lying in a hospital bed, is there hope that Ian can restore the harmony to the bottoms? So that obviously sounds like a ridiculous mess, but also kind of like quite a bit of fun, which is why I put on this list. Okay, camera shifted again. I'm sorry, it's gonna continue happening. These videos take a long time to film and like phones ring and stuff like that happens. <laughs> Housemates <laughs> by Emma Copley Eisenberg. This one has 70 ratings on Goodreads with a 4.33 average. It comes out on May 28th. I really like this cover a lot. I'm kind of into this new, it's not like a trend yet, but I feel like there've been a couple covers that have like these really bright colors mixed with like either like a sepia toned or black and white photo and I enjoy those. When Bernie replies to Leah's ad for a new housemate in Philadelphia, the two begin an intense and defiantly uncategorizable friendship based on the mutual belief in their art and one another. Both aspire to capture the world around them, Leah through her writing, Bernie through her photography. After Bernie's former photography professor, the renowned yet tarnished Daniel Dunn, dies and leaves her a complicated inheritance, Leah volunteers to accompany Bernie to his home in rural Pennsylvania, turning the, jo the jaunt into a road trip with an ambitious mission to document America through words and photographs. What ensues is a three-week journey into the heart of the nation, bringing the artist's 
into conversation with people from all walks of life, the absurd dreamers and failures of this wide, wide country, as they try to make sense of the times they are living in. Along the way, Leah and Bernie discover what it means to pursue their own ideas and dreams and to embrace what they are capable of both romantically and artistically. That just sounded like a good, you know, lit y type read. I'm guessing that's going to swing slightly more lit -fic than contemporary fic, but um, I went to college in Pennsylvania near Philadelphia, so I always like stuff that's set there. Next, we have Joe Nothing's Guide to Life by Helen Fisher. This currently has 213 ratings on Goodreads with a 4.54 average, and it comes out on May 28th. Joe Nathan likes the two parts of his name separate, just like dinner and dessert. Mean Charlie at work sometimes calls him Joe Nothing, but Joe is far from nothing. Joe is a good friend, good at his job, good at making things and at following rules, and he is learning to do lots of things by himself. Joe's mother knows there are a million things he isn't prepared for yet. While she helps to guide him every day, she is also writing notebooks of advice for Joe of all the things she hasn't yet told him about life and things he might forget. By following her advice, Joe's life is about to be more of a surprise than he expects because he's about to learn that the remarkable things can happen when you leave your comfort zone and that you can do even the hardest things with little help from your friends. So Joe is said that he is neurodivergent, doesn't say specifically if there's a certain diagnosis or not. I have like a sneaking suspicion this is gonna be sad. I'm not gonna read any spoilers though, but I just, oh yeah, the first review, I sobbed. <laughs> I was right. Okay, next we've got Summer After Summer by Lauren Bailey. And this is a persuasion retelling, which is my favorite Jane Austen novel. Currently is 156 ratings on Goodreads with a 3.82 average, and it is coming out on May 7th. I decided to put this in um, contemporary fiction instead of romance because of the description, which sounds like it's got a romance and it. it's a persuasion retelling, but it sounds more like a little more like family drama, like contemporary fiction. Olivia Taylor's marriage is in a death spiral when she agrees to come home to the Hamptons to help her father and sisters pack up the family estate. It looks like she's running away from her soon-to-be ex West and New York City, and well, she is. But someone has to take care of things, and that's always been Olivia's role in the family. After years of financial trouble, someone's finally bailing them out with a huge offer to buy their beachfront property, which is a good thing, although it means losing the home she grew up in where her mother died and where she first met Fred, the love of her life. It's been five years since the last time things blew up between Olivia and Fred, but much longer since the first time. At this point, Olivia fears it was never meant to be, so there's no reason to feel butterflies in her stomach at the idea of seeing him again. They've already tried and tried again and again, but she's newly single and she isn't the same person she was last time and Fred has changed too. This time things will be different. Maybe, just maybe, the fifth time's the charm. That sounds like a fun beach read. I really like Persuasion because it's a second chance romance and I think that's an interesting taken for Jane Austen because so many of her heroines are quite young, but um, Anne Elliot definitely feels much more mature because of that. And then lastly for this section, I have The Heirloom by Jesse Rossin. It has 182 ratings on Goodreads with a 3.56 average and it's coming out on May 7th. Shay Anderson's beloved Nona had endless rules for a happy, healthy life. Avoid owls, never put a hat in a bed, and never ever accept a marriage proposal that comes with an heirloom ring. Happily ever after is hard enough without bad karma in the mix. Naturally, Panic sets in when Shay's boyfriend, John, proposes with an heirloom ring. Yes is her answer, but Nona's warning sets Shay on a mission to ensure the ring contains good vibes. She will find his previously owners wherever they may be. With the help of her long-suffering big sister and nosy journalist eager for a big story, Shay embarks on a journey that takes her from Los Angeles to New York to Italy to Portugal. That seems like a fun thing to read in the summer. If you can't travel, you might as well live vicariously through the book you're reading about their travel. Okay, so that was my last contemporary fiction one. Now let's move on to historical fiction. Okay, we're going to start with Daughters of Shandong by Eve J. Chung. It currently has 106 ratings on Goodreads with a 4.77 average and is coming out on May 7th. Daughters are the Aang's family curse. In 1948, Civil War, War ravages the Chinese countryside, but in rural Shandong, the wealthy landowning Aangs are more concerned with their lack of an heir. Hai is the eldest of four girls and spends her days looking after her sisters. Headstrong Dee, who is just a year younger, learns to hide in plain sight, and their mother, abused by the family for failing to birth a boy, finds her own small acts of rebellion in the kitchen. As the communist army closes in on their town, the rest of the prosperous household flees, leaving behind the girls and their mother because they view them as useless mouths to feed. Without an Aang male to punish, the land-seizing cadres choose Hai as the eldest child to stand trial for her family's crimes. She barely survives their brutality. Realizing the worst is yet to come, the women plan their escape. Starving and penniless but resourceful, they forge travel permits and embark on a thousand-mile journey to confront the family that abandoned them. 
from the countryside to the bustling city of Qingdao and onward to British Hong Kong and eventually Taiwan, they witnessed the changing tide of a nation and the plight of multitudes caught in the wake of revolution. But with the loss of their home and the life they've known also comes new freedom to take hold of their fate, to shake free of the bonds of their gender and to claim their own story. I bet that's gonna be really sad, but that also just sounds like so moving and very interesting to read. Um, I like finding historical fiction pieces that are maybe of time periods that are not as thoroughly explored as like World War II maybe is. So this is, you know, after World War II and the Revolution in China, it sounds pretty interesting. Next is Ella by Diane Richards. Um, it comes out May 7th. It has 33 ratings on Goodreads and a 4.06 average. It is a biographical fiction piece about Ella Fitzgerald. And the reason I um, put it on this list, it doesn't have very many ratings, obviously, but it's called In the Vein of the Paris Wife and the Personal Librarian. I didn't read The Personal Librarian, but I loved The Paris Wife that came out several years ago. And so I was like, ah, since they're comparing to that, I bet this might end up being a hit. When 15-year-old Ella Fitzgerald's mother dies at the height of the Depression in 1932, the teenager goes to work for the mob to support herself and her family. When the law finally catches up, the ungovernable adolescent is incarcerated in the New York Training School for Girls in upstate New York, a wicked prison infamous for its harsh treatment of inmates, especially the black ones. Determined to be free, Ella escapes and makes her way back to Harlem where she is forced to dance for pennies on the street. Looking for a break into show business, Ella draws straws to appear at the Apollo's Theater Amateur Night in uh, 1934. Rather than perform a dance routine directly after the famous Edward sisters numbers, the homeless Ella wearing men's galoshes a size too big risks everything when she decides to sing Judy Garland instead. Four years later, at barely 21, Ella Fitzgerald has become a best-selling female vocalist in America. And then it just goes on to say that this is really just like a bi biographical piece of fiction. Which I don't think I've ever read a biographical piece of fiction about someone who's like, from recent history, because I consider her to be pretty recent history. She was alive in the 1900s. I was alive in the 1900s. So we'll see what ends up happening with that. If it ends up being a hit, I don't know. And then lastly, for historical fiction, I have Last House by Jessica Shattuck, question mark. It has 127 ratings with a 3.88 average. It comes out on May 14th. It's 1953 and for Nick Taylor, World War II veteran, Tarrant Company lawyer, oil is the key to the future. He takes the train to the city for work and returns to the peaceful streets of the suburbs to his wife, Bette, a former codebreaker and now housewife, and their two children, Catherine and Harry. Nick comes from humble origins, but thanks to his work for, for American Oil, he can provide every comfort to his family, including Last House, a secluded country escape. Deep in the Vermont mountains, the Taylors are free from the stresses of modern life. Bette doesn't have to worry about the Russian H-bombs that haunt her dreams, and the children roam free in the woods. Last House is a place that could survive the end of the world. It's 1968 now. We jump. And America is on the brink of change. Protesters fill the streets to challenge everything from the Vietnam War to racism in the wake of Martin Luther King's shooting to the country's reliance on big oil. As Catherine makes her first forays into adult life, she's caught up in the current time and struggles to reconcile her ideals with the stable and privileged childhood her greatest generation parents worked so hard to provide. But when the movement shifts into a more radical direction, each member of the Taylor family will be forced to reckon with the consequences of the choices they've made and the causes they believe in. So it says that it spans multiple generations in nearly 80 years. So it's kind of telling the story of like the second half of the um, 20th century in America. And I th thought, thought that might be a good read. And then one last book I did want to highlight that doesn't go into any of my categories because it's horror is You Like a Darker by Stephen King it has a book coming out on May 21st. It's a collection of 12 Short stories, um, it's 512 pages. Jeez Louise, that's a thick book. Um, it comes out May 21st. I can't remember if I ever said that. I might have. And I just wanted to tell you about that because I know a lot of people love Stephen King, even though I'm not a horror reader, so I will not be reading it. But uh, that is coming out as well. And those are all the books I have for you for May. That's like nowhere near an exhaustive list because hundreds of books come out every month. Um, but those are just the ones that I thought would maybe be picked by Book of the Month or Aardvark or just interesting ones to keep on your radar as you maybe build your TBR for summer. May is always the month that I feel like, partially because my birthday is in May and I buy myself a lot of books, but I use the month of May really to build what I'm going to read over the summer. I like to not buy books in the month of July. I usually buy some in June and some in August. But um, so May is my big purchase month. So after watching that entire video, thank you for hanging out if you are still here. Um, let me know in the comments what sounds the most interesting to you or if there are other books that are coming out that I missed or just didn't add to the list and you want to talk about, please throw them on there. And if you've made it this far and you don't want to write words, uh, give me a flower emoji. We're, it's spring. Spring is here. And we are deep into the allergy season here. <laughs> 
And then also don't forget that the book I am actually most excited that is coming out in May is my own book, The Hedge Witch, coming out on May 14th. There's always a link in the description if you want to check it out. And as always, I hope you're in the middle of a good book, about to start reading a good book, or about to start writing a great book. I'll see you soon. Thank you.